The History Channel. On a wintry morning in January 1895, a French army captain was stripped of his rank. A crowd of thousands chanted, death to the traitor. His crime, high treason, selling military secrets to the enemy. But Alfred Dreyfus was an innocent man. He was a victim of a country rife with anti-Semitism and an army riddled with corruption. Join us as we go in search of history and explore the infamous Dreyfus Affair. In an obscure park in downtown Paris stands the statue of Captain Alfred Dreyfus, a man whose name still invokes images of injustice and anti-Semitism, 100 years after he was wrongly convicted of treason. France, 1894. The nation was still hurting from its degrading loss to Germany 23 years earlier in the Franco-Prussian War. France had been forced to give its Alsace and Lorraine regions to Germany and pay an indemnity of five billion francs, an amount equivalent to the taxes collected by the French government over a two-year period. It was a humiliating defeat that left the French bitter, spiteful, and wary. Keeping an eye on Germans living in their country was a full-time and vindictive job for French counterintelligence. The focus of their espionage activities? The German embassy in Paris. The French had an inside source, a maid named Marie Bastion. She worked at the German embassy, where her duties included emptying the waste paper baskets used by German officials. A cleaning woman in the German embassy found a little memo torn up, a testimonial incidentally to the primitive level of spying in those days. Every week, Bastion delivered scraps of letters, reports, and records to a member of the French Army's elite general staff. The torn-up memo was painstakingly reassembled by Major Hubert Joseph Henri, a member of the Army's counterintelligence unit. It was disturbing. Whoever wrote it had access to sensitive information about the 120 millimeter cannon, France's latest super weapon. Everybody said, my God, we've got a spy in our midst. The spy signed himself by the pseudonym Jacques Dubois. In other reports, the Germans referred to him as that scoundrel D. Only an artillery officer on the general staff could have access to such information. Major Henri scanned the roster of names and found only one beginning with the letter D. Captain Alfred Dreyfus. Henri compared the handwriting on the note with routine army reports that Dreyfus had prepared. The match wasn't a perfect match, but the ambitious Henri felt it was close enough and began an investigation of Captain Dreyfus. But Dreyfus didn't fit the profile of a spy. He was happily married with two children. He had no debts. He came from an upstanding family that had fled the German occupation of Alsace 20 years earlier. He had graduated ninth in his class at the War College and was well on his way to a glowing army career but he was also a Jew. He was utterly patriotic. He was absorbed with the idea of being an officer and an officer as a man of honor. He was a dedicated military man. He saw himself first as a Frenchman and only secondarily as a Jew. 
Though the French government had been the first European nation to give Jews citizenship, many French were wary of their rapid rise in society. France was a complicated place for Jews at the end of the 19th century. Anti-Semitism was rampant. There was social anti-Semitism. There was the beginnings of political anti-Semitism. But at the same time, Jews were found in all levels of French society. On October 15th, 1894, Dreyfus was told to report in civilian clothes to the office of the Army Chief of Staff. Without explanation, Dreyfus was ordered to write a letter using many of the same words found in the reassembled note. When he finished, he was placed under arrest for high treason. Major Henri had his man. The nice thing about villains in this case is how many of them are obviously villainous. Henri is a brute. He is a self-made brute. He is semi-illiterate. He is uh, very tough. Most of the time, he doesn't really know what he's doing. He is the figure of the jobber of the horse trader who will do anything to camouflage weaknesses in his product. Dreyfus was dragged to prison. He protested violently. He screamed of his innocence. He banged his head against the stone walls of his cell. How could he be charged with a crime so vile? For two weeks, Dreyfus was held while the army tried to build a case. Dreyfus's wife, Lucie, was told of her husband's arrest. But she was warned if she uttered a word to anyone, she would never see her husband again. When word of the arrest was leaked to the newspapers, the army was forced to act. Headlines in several anti-Semitic papers screamed, a Jewish traitor in our midst. That a spy should be found, that a spy should be arrested, is already a sensational piece of news. That this spy should be Jewish, a Jewish captain in the Holy of Holies, the general staff, is even hotter news. Dreyfus faced court-martial. Three writing experts testified, saying that Dreyfus's script resembled the handwriting found on the note from the German embassy. The military came under intense pressure to prosecute. After all, they had a crime of espionage. They had a suspect. What were they going to do? Having been forced to go to trial, they felt that they had to do whatever was necessary to win a conviction, and therefore they took the illegal road of creating a dossier of documents which were purported to refer to Dreyfus, but which in fact did not. Documents forged by army officers and shown only to the judges told a bogus story of Dreyfus the traitor, Dreyfus the spy. He was quickly convicted. Two weeks later, in the courtyard of the École Militaire, he was publicly degraded in front of his fellow soldiers. The crowd chanted, death to the traitor, death to the Jew. But Dreyfus shocked the crowd when he shouted, Soldiers, they are degrading an innocent man. Soldiers, they are dishonoring an innocent man. Long live France. Long live the army. Almost immediately, Dreyfus was taken to a port where he waited for a ship to transport him to one of the most notorious prisons in the world, the French Guiana nightmare called Devil's Island. Convicted of high treason, Alfred Dreyfus was determined he would clear his name.
On the deck of the prison ship San Nazaire, he huddled against icy cold winds in a cramped open air cell. Within a week, though, the weather grew warmer. The ship was headed south toward the Salvation Islands of French Guiana, located off the coast of South America. Dreyfus was being sent to the smallest and most notorious speck of land in the chain, Devil's Island. No one could claim that Devil's Island and French Guiana in general uh, is anything other than a true hellhole. Uh, there were scorpions. Uh, there are spiders the size of a man's fist. Uh, there is endemic malaria. It is truly an awful place. Devil's Island had once been a leper colony, but conditions were so bad that the lepers had to be removed. The climate was always torrid, with temperatures hovering in the 90s. It rained from April through June, and again from November through January. The seas surrounding the island were filled with sharks, and the currents were swift and deadly. Dreyfus arrived at his new home on April 14, 1895. He lived in a single-room, square hut. The door opened to a guard's quarters, through which Dreyfus had to pass in order to get to his exercise yard, a small, rectangular patch of ground surrounded by a stockade fence. The guard was rotated every two hours to ensure fresh eyes were always on the prisoner. He had a few books and some writing paper, nothing else. A lamp burned 24 hours a day inside his hut. He was forbidden to sleep in the dark. Dreyfus wrote to his wife about his daily routine. I rise at daybreak and light my fire. I put dried vegetables on the fire and afterwards make my bed and clean my chamber. At eight o'clock, they bring me the day's rations. I finish cooking the dried vegetables and on middays place these rations on the fire. Next, I read, work, dream, and most of all, suffer. When the heat has diminished, I cut my wood, draw water from the well and wash my linen. At six, I eat the cold remains of my lunch. Then I am locked up for the night. While Dreyfus rotted in his tropical prison, his family tried desperately to clear his name. His brother, Mathieu Dreyfus, left his family business determined to find a sympathetic government official to help. Matthew is really the hero of the whole story. If there was anybody who deserves a statue, it would be Matthew. He never gives up faith, and he never stops ferreting around uh, to find the evidence that would prove uh, his uh, brother's innocence. He did whatever was necessary. He spent whatever money, he investigated, he made the rounds, he looked for champions among legislators, he looked for champions everywhere. Meanwhile, an unlikely hero emerged. Lieutenant Colonel Marie-Georges Picard was named to head the Army's counterintelligence unit. His mission? maintain tight surveillance of the German embassy. Georges Picard uh, is a peculiar man. He is one of the heroes of the affair, and uh, his personality shows just how 
ambiguous heroism can be, because Picard, who is an Alsatian Catholic anti-Semite, is also a righteous man in the manifold sense of the term. He will follow evidence wherever it may lead, and if it isn't satisfactory, he will follow it by illegal means, if need be. In March 1896, the maid at the German embassy gave a package of torn up documents to Picard. One was an unsent telegram addressed to Major Marie Charles Ferdinand Walsin Esterhazy. The telegram, written by a German official, asked Esterhazy for a more detailed explanation than you gave me the other day. Picard wondered why a German embassy official would be writing to a French officer, especially Esterhazy, who had such a dubious reputation. He was a rake. He was always chasing after the latest speculation. He was a gambler. He had a string of mistresses. And he had a wife who was addicted to luxury. All of which meant that he needed money desperately all of the time. Military salaries were simply insufficient. Picard had Esterhazy followed. He was twice seen visiting the German embassy. Picard went further. He opened Esterhazy's mail and made a sickening discovery. The handwriting was a close match to that found on the note used to convict Dreyfus. Picard became convinced the army had convicted an innocent man. In September 1896, Major Picard went to his superiors to report an egregious error. The French army had convicted an innocent man, Captain Alfred Dreyfus. This involved espionage, and Picard was an absolutely loyal soldier who felt it was his job to solve espionage cases because he was the head of French intelligence. He simply was doing his job and insisted upon doing it. Picard was convinced that the evidence used to put Dreyfus on Devil's Island was actually the work of another member of the Army's officer corps, Major Esterhazy. What Picard did not know was that the bogus case against Dreyfus had been sanctioned by the same top officers to whom he was now presenting his evidence. Picard was shocked when his superiors told him to keep quiet. The Dreyfus Affair is a classic episode of a cover-up in that the French military leadership, having determined early on that Dreyfus was guilty, having staked its reputation and the reputation of its hierarchy and its authority, having staked that reputation on Dreyfus's guilt. The military leadership felt that it simply could not afford to see this conviction unravel. Picard was sent on an indefinite tour of Tunisia. Being a soldier of honor, he never dreamed of publicly exposing what he had found, but he feared for his life. He gave a letter to his lawyer detailing the Dreyfus Esterhazy case. If anything should happen to him, Picard said, the letter should be delivered to the president of France. Then, news reports in late 1896 carried an incredible story. Alfred Dreyfus had escaped from Devil's Island. None of it was true. The story had been planted by Dreyfus's brother, Mathieu, who was willing to do anything to keep Alfred's name in the papers. 
tragically, the ploy had an unexpected backlash. Dreyfus was subjected to even harsher treatment after the fake story was published. He was shackled to his bed at night, the iron cuffs digging welts into his skin. A second stockade fence, even higher than the first, was built around his hut, eliminating his small view. Since he was not allowed any news from the outside world, Dreyfus had no idea why he was being punished. I am so utterly weary, so broken down in body and soul, that today I stop my diary. Not being able to foresee how long my strength will hold out, or what day my brain will succumb under the weight of so great a burden. But Mathieu's plan had worked. It put Alfred Dreyfus in the public eye, and the French press was having a field day uncovering new information about the Dreyfus affair. Public sentiment became violently polarized into two groups. The Dreyfusards, those who believed Dreyfus was innocent, and the anti-Dreyfusards, those who believed him guilty. People got emotional and irrational about the Dreyfus case because what they saw was a clash of values. This was not, for many, the issue of one man who was suffering injustice. It was a clash of attitudes toward the power of the state and just what France would represent. Finally, three years after his brother's arrest, Mathieu Dreyfus went public with information he had collected and the startling conclusion he had come to. It was something that many in the army had known all along. Another army officer's handwriting matched the writing in the letter that had convicted Alfred Dreyfus. Mathieu Dreyfus publicly accused Major Esterhazy of treason. The country was in an uproar. How dare a Jew make such an accusation? Esterhazy met with an officer from the Army's general staff who promised assistance in disproving Mathieu Dreyfus's charge. The Army wanted to cover up Esterhazy's guilt because it had already found its traitor, and that was Alfred Dreyfus. To admit that Esterhazy was involved in espionage would be to suggest that their whole case had been wrong, a mistake, that they were not capable of protecting the French state because spies were all over the place and they were unable to locate them. Esterhazy was so emboldened that he demanded a court-martial in order to clear his name. Within a week, Esterhazy was acquitted. Public venom toward Alfred Dreyfus, driven by the press, reached a pitched frenzy. There was now no doubt that he had betrayed France and its beloved army. It seemed certain Dreyfus would swelter for the rest of his life on the hellhole of Devil's Island. The moment a French military court acquitted Major Esterhazy of treason, army officials thought the Dreyfus affair was finished. But two days after the trial ended, the pro-Dreyfus forces gained an influential ally. Novelist Emile Zola, well known for his fiction exposing corruption. He was the first person to publicly name high-ranking army officers suspected of participating in a cover-up. Zola wrote a newspaper expose titled Jacuz. 
I accuse the three handwriting experts of having composed deceitful and fraudulent reports. I accuse the officers of war of having conducted in the press an abominable campaign designed to mislead public opinion and conceal their wrongdoing. I accuse the first court martial of having violated the law in convicting a defendant on the basis of a document kept secret. I accuse the second court martial of having covered up that illegality by committing in turn the judicial crime of knowingly acquitting a guilty man. On the night of the 12th of January, 1898, Zola wrote what came to be the most famous letter to the editor of all time. It is one of those moments that one remembers very much in the way that people uh, of the baby boom generation remember the moment when they heard that John Kennedy had been assassinated. Where were you when Jacuz was published? Far more than 200,000 people in Paris were suddenly reading the newspapers. They were being snatched from hand to hand, being passed around, because everyone wanted to read this. Zola was an intensely famous writer, and this was an absolute indictment of the government. Here comes Zola, who makes extraordinary statements accusing the most respected representatives of the army. Uh, of fraud, of lying, cheating, defrauding the public. He was going to break through the wall of silence. He was going to explode everything. After Jacques, nothing was ever the same. The article became a rallying cry for Dreyfusards, but it also led to a violent backlash. Riots ripped through the nation as the two sides squared off in the streets. The government had Zola arrested for libel. He was quickly convicted. But while awaiting appeal, he fled to England. But Zola had achieved his goal. The eyes of the world had turned to France. The army and government could no longer ignore the Dreyfus affair. The army officers responsible for Dreyfus's conviction panicked. They created more phony documents to further implicate Dreyfus as a spy. Henri, by now promoted to lieutenant colonel, came forward with a letter he said had been found in pieces in the trash at the German embassy. It was an utterly innocuous letter, but it provided two important things, a heading and a signature, both of which are difficult to forge. Henri had a second letter, which was almost entirely a blank sheet of paper, by tearing these two pieces of paper carefully, he created what he thought was a perfect match of a single page, the top and bottom from the first letter and the middle from the second. On the blank middle part of the page, Henri wrote about Dreyfus being a spy. He photographed it because he didn't want anyone looking too carefully at this and he passed the photograph around as the proof positive. France's Minister of War, Godfroy Cavignac, delivered an impassioned speech to Parliament, saying that he had reviewed the new material and believed it to be authentic. But privately, Cavignac was uncertain. He had only recently been named Minister of War, and he had no knowledge of the conspiracy that had put Dreyfus in prison. He ordered an aide, Captain Louis Quignet, to make sure all documents involved with the case were genuine. Under orders to finish the task by morning, Quignet worked late into the night. 
When he held the documents up to candlelight, he discovered the letter Henri had said was written by a German official naming Dreyfus as a spy was fake. The two pieces of paper with which Henri had worked had slightly different fine lines in them. This difference was not noticeable in daylight. And Henri had either worked during daylight or without an intense lamp and had not noticed that the lines in the three pieces that he had put together were slightly different. When uh, Quigné held the document up to the light, he could show exactly where one began and the other began. Henri was arrested. After several hours of interrogation, he admitted creating the evidence against Dreyfus. He said he still believed Dreyfus to be guilty, and he forged the documents because a conviction was best for France. He was thrown in jail, but was found dead the next day, his throat slit in an apparent suicide. Let's see it. Henri was suicided, and this is a French phrase, a meaning, a suicide that not everyone believes to be one. With the conspiracy starting to unravel, Esterhazy fled to England, where he proclaimed he was innocent of all charges. On June 3, 1899, four and a half years after Dreyfus was convicted of treason, the French High Court annulled the verdict and ordered Dreyfus to stand trial again. Dreyfus was freed from his jungle prison and returned to France, only to face a startling verdict. When Alfred Dreyfus returned to France after more than four years in exile on Devil's Island, he found a country in turmoil over him. Because his mail had been censored, he had no idea what had happened during his absence. Though his time in prison had not destroyed his spirit, physically, Dreyfus was devastated. His health was shattered. He had lost a very great deal of weight. He had malaria. He seemed so weak and insignificant that he didn't seem like a hero. He was not at all what his supporters had wanted him to be. Well, what else could he have been after four and a half years in hell? Dreyfus's second court-martial began on August 7, 1899. Astonishingly, the letter written by Esterhazy that was used to convict him in 1894 was again presented as evidence. And though Henri, the chief accuser of Dreyfus, was dead, the army reiterated his story for the record. That military court had to choose between the rights of generals and the rights of man. Well, if you're a senior officer, I think the situation is clear. You choose the rights of generals. Incredibly, Dreyfus was found guilty a second time, though the court handed down the verdict with extenuating circumstances a phrase used in French law that meant the judges were uncertain of complete guilt. Nevertheless, Dreyfus was sentenced to 10 years. The army was able to convict Dreyfus a second time because the issues for the army were not Dreyfus's individual guilt or innocence, but rather the stability of France and the honor of the army itself. Dreyfus was dumbfounded. The verdict outraged his supporters. Emile Zola wrote, The decision is one of ignorance, folly, cruelty, and falsehood. Future generations will shudder when looking at this verdict. 
After all, Jesus was condemned but once. But the president of France, sensing an endless debate without victory, pardoned Dreyfus 10 days after his second conviction. The country was preparing to host the 1900 World's Fair and did not want the specter of the Dreyfus affair hanging overhead. Dreyfus reluctantly accepted the pardon, but vowed to clear his name. My heart will not be at rest until there is no longer a Frenchman who imputes to me the abominable crime which another has committed. On July 12, 1906, his efforts paid off. The French High Court annulled the second court-martial verdict. This time, the court did not ask for a new trial. A day later, French Parliament voted to reinstate Dreyfus into the army. A week later, Alfred Dreyfus was inducted into the French Legion of Honor in a ceremony at the École Militaire, the place where 12 years earlier he had been stripped of his rank. This time, the crowd shouted, Long live Dreyfus. A year later, Dreyfus retired from the army. On June 4, 1908, he placed the ashes of his friend Emile Zola at the Pantheon, a mausoleum for the nation's honored dead. During the ceremony honoring Zola, Dreyfus was shot. He survived. The would-be assassin, a writer, was found not guilty by reason of insanity. In August 1914, as World War I began, Dreyfus returned to active military duty. Attached to an artillery unit, he saw action, fighting against the Germans, the same people he was accused of spying for two decades earlier. He survived the war and outlived his rival, Major Esterhazy. In May 1923, Esterhazy, the real traitor, died in England, penniless. He had never returned to France and went to his grave professing his innocence. Dreyfus lived quietly for the rest of his years. He maintained his privacy and rarely discussed the affair for which he was famous. On July 12, 1935, Alfred Dreyfus died in Paris at the age of 75. 29 years to the day after he had been declared innocent by the French High Court. He was buried in a private ceremony at Montparnasse Jewish Cemetery on July 14th, Bastille Day, the national holiday celebrating French independence. The Dreyfus affair at its best means standing up against oppression, standing up against the wrong, being willing to risk for what is right. And for those people who did it and wound up freeing Dreyfus, it was a great thing. And for most people, it was the greatest thing they ever did in their lives. And it would be difficult to imagine how they could surpass it. I think the major lesson is the vulnerability of the individual when faced with the institutions of the state, when those institutions are not committed to the defense of the individual. But the bitterness against Dreyfus persists for exposing the ignoble side of French government and its military and the country's deep-seated anti-Semitic roots. In the first half of the 1990s, when Mitterrand's Minister of Culture ordered a large statue of Dreyfus to be made that would be placed 
in the courtyard of the military school on the anniversary of the degradation of the captain. That caused an extraordinary rumpus, like putting uh, a statue of Sherman in uh, Savannah. The statue was banished to a distant corner of the Tuileries Gardens, where you could visit it if you could find it, looking at a wall. Later, under orders from then Paris Mayor Jacques Chirac, the statue was further removed. This time it was taken to an obscure park in central Paris, close to where Dreyfus is buried, but far from the heavily traveled tourist areas of the nation's historic landmarks. There will always be forces that want to hide the sins of the past. Stories like the Dreyfus Affair remind us why we need to continue to go in search of history.